My name is Justin. Um, I'm one of the past TAs of this course. <clears throat> and I'll be presenting owner's slides for today's lecture. Um, and the topic is on memory scheduling, something that you all will be coming a lot more familiar with once you start the next lab. Um, so keep in mind some of the things that you see today and the things that you learned in the last lecture because you're going to be implementing a lot of that into your next lab assignment. So, right, this is on memory scheduling. Um, before we start here, let's just quickly review the last couple of lectures, what we learned. So I think last Wednesday, you were looking at main memory. Um, you looked at the organization and the operation of DRAM there. So, and you also learned about memory controllers. Um, so just to refresh your memory, no pun intended, you basically have programs that are issuing loads and stores. Those need to be satisfied somewhere. Um, that location is typically main memory. So we have a bunch of devices, let's say DRAM devices, dynamic random access memory, where we can just give them an address and they'll give us a value. Or we can give them an address and some data and it'll store a value. And the next time we go to send an address there and ask for some data, whatever we stored there will be given back to us and it'll stay there until we turn off the computer. Now, one question that arises when we have this sort of main memory that we're working with is, what if we have a bunch of different requests from different programs or different threads within a program that all want to access memory at the same time? Well, then we have to actually manage which requests do we service when. And that's the job of the memory controller. It determines what time do I start servicing different requests. And you learned about some of the basic operation of that, and we'll go into more detail in the slides today. Um, you also heard on Friday from a couple of grad students about DRAM design and enhancement. So you looked at a bit um, more detail about how data is actually stored within DRAM devices in the context of subarrays. Remember, those are kind of like the little things that make up a DRAM chip where we actually put all of the bits. You learned about one technique called row clone, which is used to efficiently copy data from one place to another in memory, something that we can do, we do quite frequently, um, or the OS does frequently. And you learned about a little bit of in DRAM computation. Also, you learned about tiered latency DRAM, the idea being that you can have some parts of DRAM that are faster than others, and how do you determine what data goes in the fast parts of DRAM versus what goes in the slower parts of DRAM. So, before we get to the more memory scheduling related topics and the rest of the lecture, do any of you have any questions about the material that you've learned so far related to the memory system or really anything else? Because it's good that it would be good to clarify those right now because we're just going to go deeper and deeper into memory scheduling from here on. Everybody's cool with memory scheduling? OK, great. If you have questions, just feel free to bring them up. So right now, you all know one very basic memory access scheduling policy, or you should, FRFCFS, first ready, first come, first serve, also known as row hit first scheduling. So can somebody briefly give me a high level overview of what FRFCFS tries to do? Yeah. So I think you have this thing called the row buffer, mm -hmm. and you want to, like anything that's there, you can just keep loading so you don't have to do it, like, uncharging it Again. That's right. So you want to put all of those requests together such that you maximize having that little buffer there. Yeah, exactly. So remember, we have these DRAM chips, right? And the chips have this thing called a row buffer. And a row buffer are just these really fast uh, storage area that we can access data. Because in the DRAM device, when we go to access some byte, we don't just access that single byte. For various reasons, we access a bunch of bytes that are nearby it, maybe around four kilobytes worth of data. And that data is placed in this thing called the row buffer. And the row buffer is really fast to access compared to the rest of DRAM. So what we'd like to try and do is service all of the requests that go to the row buffer first, and then go to some other location in DRAM where we clear the contents of the row buffer and bring something else in. 
So what we're going to be looking at today are a bunch of variations of taking advantage of how DRAM is organized in order to improve application performance or prevent applications from attacking one another or just to more efficiently utilize the memory system. OK, so basically what I just said, we'll look at some row buffer management policies. We have this row buffer. How can we use it efficiently? And we'll also look at some memory interference um, sources and ways that we can eliminate that um, in systems with a focus on memory request scheduling, which is the topic of today's lecture. OK, so we kind of just talked about this. I guess we even jumped ahead a little bit. Before first ready, first come, first serve, there's an even more simple policy that you can think of, which is just first come, first serve. So in chronological order from when requests were received at the memory controller, we schedule them to main memory. As we just discussed, this isn't necessarily very efficient because it doesn't utilize that structure that's within DRAM, the row buffer, efficiently. So that's why we have first ready, first come, first serve, which has two rules. We'll break this down into two rules because as you'll see in the rest of the lecture, each of the different scheduling techniques have their own set of rules. Some of them maybe have four different rules that they use. Some are simpler like FRFCFS and they have two rules. But it's helpful when looking at these memory scheduling policies to think about them in terms of what order, what total order do we prioritize requests in. For FRFCFS, we have row hit first and then we have oldest first. Maximize row buffer hit rate. Great. Um, so just a quick aside here. So far, we've been talking about this thing, uh, memory scheduling, in terms of scheduling requests, like loads or stores, things that we're used to from programming um, our own binaries. But when you actually get down to the level of accessing the devices, these devices don't talk about memory in terms of loads and stores. You don't buy a DRAM chip that sort of has a, a load pin that's asserted when you want to load something and you, you give it the address and it give, gives you some data. They actually work by receiving and sending back different commands. So a command might be, I would like to access this row of DRAM, like we kind of talked about and you might be familiar with. Or a command might be, with the, pre with the currently accessed row of DRAM in this chip, I would like to access this column. So actually, memory schedulers break up requests like load address A into I would like to access this row that contains A, and then after a certain amount of time, I would like to access this column that contains A. So you'll actually be performing your scheduling based on different commands that are required to access these different DRAM devices. So keep that in mind as, you're, as we're talking about these memory scheduling policies. So you might have learned about a couple already, column commands, which are basically read and write to different columns within a row of data. And those are typically prioritized over row commands, which change the row of data. And as we mentioned, those operations take a lot longer to perform. And within each group, older commands are prioritized over younger ones just so that we can continue making forward progress. OK. And as we mentioned, so we have these different levels of priority that we assign requests. A scheduling policy is basically just a total order that we can prioritize different requests in. And there's a bunch of things that we can choose when making this prioritization decision. For example, request age is one that we've seen already with first come, first serve, right? Row buffer hit or miss status, that's kind of taken into account in first ready, first come, first serve. Request type, how many of, have you discussed what prefetching is yet? So what's prefetching? Can somebody give me a, just a, a very high level summary of what prefetching is? Basically yeah. you load memory that you think it will be in the future. That's right. Like yeah, so there's this idea that Sometimes programs have some sort of regular behavior. Maybe we could think of a program that's just streaming through memory, comparing two different streams, strings, sorry. And as it's streaming through memory, it's just accessing one address after the other, right? What if we could predict 
that it's going to access a certain address and issue a request for that data in advance. So by the time we actually get to that address in the string, it's already loaded into our cache, let's say. That's, a, that's an example of a prefetch command. Can anybody think about why you might want to prioritize prefetch commands differently from read or write commands that are being issued on demand from a processor? Any ideas? Yeah? Because you don't actually need it yet, whereas you do need the read. At least the read you, you do need. Yeah. So there's this idea that we kind of have a critical path of computation in our program, a set of things that we must do at this very moment. And prefetch commands, even though they can be helpful for performance, are not necessarily on the critical path of computation that we need to complete. So we might not want to prioritize them as highly. Requester type, so load miss or store miss. Why might we want to prioritize reads versus writes? differently. Can you think of any ideas? Think about the critical path of the program. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this idea that writes, unless they're being read from again, aren't necessarily on the critical path of computation. So if I'm just going through and I'm writing a bunch of data and I'm never reading it, or I'm not reading it for a long time, I don't necessarily need to perform all of those writes to memory right away. But if I'm reading something and I need to then add you know, the number 5 to it, I need that to happen right now. So we might want to prioritize reads over writes. And request what we'll call criticality, which has to do with how important something is for making forward progress in a program. Um, maybe we want to prioritize the oldest miss in a particular core, or how many instructions are dependent on it in the control flow of the program. OK, so let's talk about how to manage that row buffer that we've sort of been alluding to at a very high level. So the row buffer has a couple of different states. Um, one of those states is you might have an open row where when you access some data, it gets loaded into the row buffer. We say that the row is then open. We can access data from it now. And one choice we have is when we're done servicing the request, what do we do with the contents of the row buffer? Do we leave it open? Do we push it back to memory, closing it, and thereby allowing us to open something else in the row buffer? Think about those two different decisions that we have. So if we leave it open, what does that mean? That means that we have this four kilobyte chunk of memory that we can access very quickly if we receive another request to that region of memory. So that's keeping it open. Compare that to if we close it after we're done with the request. So we take that row, we're done accessing a request, we push it back to the DRAM cells, and now the row is closed. When another request comes, whether to that same region or not, <clears throat> we're then able to open up a different row and load it in. So the main difference here is that when the second request arrives, what work do we have to perform? In the first case, if it's to the same row that was already open, we don't have to perform any additional work. We can already access it. If it's to a different row, we have a bit of a problem, because we have four kilobytes of data that we don't need at all that's located in the row buffer. What do we do? Well, we have to perform a long latency operation to push it back to memory. Whereas, if we had just closed the row, after servicing that first request, the row is ours to use for whatever. We can just access data from the memory. So that's the key difference here, is whether we leave data within the row buffer after servicing a request, we'll call that an open row policy, or whether we close the row of data after servicing the request. So the benefit, like we just talked about, was that the next access might need to access the same row as the current access. That's good. We get what's called a row hit. We're able to access data from that fast memory. On the other hand, if we need to access a different row, too bad. We're going to have to push that data back to 
the DRAM cells, and then access that other row of data. That's called a row conflict. This can waste energy as a result, um, especially if we leave the contents in the row buffer for a long amount of time and never access anything from it. In that case, we're basically storing a bunch of data, and we're using a, a certain amount of charge to keep that data stored there, and we really aren't getting anything out of it. Let's look at a closed row policy, where after we're done accessing a request, we send its data back to DRAM, and the row becomes closed. So that's basically what we just talked about. Um, one thing to mention is that with a closed row type policy, you'll still typically check to see if there are any other services that need to access that open row before you close it. So if you have a bunch of requests that have queued up to row 5, and you open row 5, load it into the row buffer, service the first request, with a closed row policy, you'll wait until all of those requests to row 5 have been serviced before you close the row then. And then you can access something else. So like we talked about, this is good if we want to access a different row. right? We don't have to go through the actions of sending the data that's already in the row buffer back to memory. So we can potentially avoid a row conflict, which can be a long latency operation. However, the next access might need to access the same row, something that maybe in the future, which wasn't queued up when we made the decision to close the row, might need to access that data again. And we can't do that in this scheme. We have to actually load it back from main memory. So this could cause extra activation latency. So there have been a number of different policies that have been developed to try and predict, should we keep this row open or should we close this row? Depending on things like program characteristics or the access stream characteristics, um, we won't be going into any detail about those policies, but it's just good to keep that in mind that this is something to consider when we're designing devices or even when you're programming um, your own uh, uh, applications. OK, so let's just go through a quick example to make this concept con more concrete. So here we have a table that compares different open and closed row policies. We have the policy um, in this first column. We'll go through a couple of examples. We have the first access to a particular row, and then we have the next access. And we'll see, we'll break down which commands are needed to service that access. So this will give you more of a feel for where that extra latency from these policies come from. So let's take a look at this first row right here, where we have an open row policy. And we go to access row 0. So row 0 is currently in the row buffer. Now we want to access row 0 again. This means that we have a row hit. That's good, because it only need, means that we need to issue a read command. That's all. We can access our data from the row buffer. Now let's take a look at this policy, where we have an open row. We access row 0. It's in the row buffer. And now we want to access row 1. Well, we have a problem. We have a row conflict. So what does this mean at the command level? First, we need to pre-charge row 0's data to send it back to the DRAM. That takes a certain amount of time. Then we need to issue an activation command for row 1. Yes? So I guess I'm a little confused about mm. this. When we write to RAM, do we write to the row buffer? And then when you pre-charge, that's actually written back to the That's cells? right. Oh, so that's that's right. right. OK. Yeah, so uh, without going you know, into too much detail, basically, when, when we do this activation command, What's actually happening is, so DRAM, as you might know, is made up of a bunch of capacitors, right? And that's how we're ultimately storing our data. But if you want to send, and, and for example, if a capacitor is filled with charge, we'll call it a 1. And if it's not filled with charge, we'll call it a 0. But this brings about the question of, if you want to read some data from a capacitor, what do you have to do? Well, you have to sense if there was charge in the capacitor or not. How do you sense if there's charge in a capacitor? Well, you could connect it to some circuit and sense if some charge is drained from the capacitor. But what does that mean? Now you're left with an empty capacitor. So after you read a one value from DRAM, what's left in the cell that stored that one value is what we would interpret as a zero value. So what that means is we have to buffer that information somewhere. 
and that's the row buffer. So when we activate, we're sensing the charge from all of the capacitors in a row, sort of storing that in a safe location, the row buffer, and when we pre-charge, we're pushing all of that charge back into the capacitors, or not, if it's a one or a zero. Good question. So going back to this example, we'll pre-charge row zero back, we'll activate row one, bringing its data into the row buffer, and then we can issue the read. That's a row conflict, which we had with this open row policy. So let's take a look at a closed row policy now. Same thing, we access row zero again, um, we service its data, and as we're accessing the read to row zero, we get another request for row zero that queues up in, in some sort of request buffer. At this point, we want to keep the row open to service that queued up request. So this will actually be a row hit with a closed row policy. We'll go ahead and service it just using the read command, okay? Similar scenario, but we have a closed row. We access row zero, closed row policy. We access row zero, it's in the row buffer. Then we have another request to row zero, but this time, this request wasn't lucky enough. It wasn't lucky enough to be queued up in the request buffer before this first request had, was done being serviced. So when we finished servicing this request, we went ahead and we stored the data back to DRAM. What this means now is that in order to service this request, even though it's to the same row, with a closed row policy, we still have to activate the row, read it, and if there's no other outstanding requests to it, pre-charge it back to the array. Does this make sense to everyone? There's a couple of, there's, there's sort of subtle differences here, and I want to make sure that everybody understands what's going on. We're all clear up until this point? Okay, good. So let's look at this sort of final example just to complete the picture. We, ac we have a closed row policy, we access row zero, and now we want to access row one. Well, here's the case where closed row actually makes a lot of sense, because what did we do before we went to access row one? Well, we had already sent the contents of row zero back to the array. The row buffer is a clean slate at this point, meaning that we can simply activate row one and read it, which would take much less time than pre-charging row zero, activating one, row one, and reading it. And then because it's a closed row policy, we'll pre-charge row zero back to the DRAM. So that's open versus closed um, row buffer policies. What we're going to sort of do next is we're going to take a deep dive into some of the more recent works that have looked at memory scheduling so we can explore some of the differences and some of the trade-offs that are provided with different types of techniques. All of these leverage things that are present in the memory system to improve performance or fairness or other things, and we'll talk about them. So let's review to sort of set the context for this discussion what a modern DRAM controller looks like. Professor Mutlu should have shown you a picture like this or maybe this exact picture before now, but let's take a quick review again. So we have in our computer system, we have a bunch of cores. They're connected to some caches. The cores can issue requests for data. The caches might send writebacks or, or request for some data to read as a result of a cache miss. These caches are going to be connected to the memory somehow in this diagram they're connected through this thing called a crossbar. Basically, everything up here can talk to everything down here. And this crossbar connects cache requests to bank request buffers. So in DRAM, the way that we issue commands or service requests are at the bank level. So when we're deciding where to place a load or a store, we'll sort of send a, a particular load or a store off to a particular bank's request buffer, okay? And then from there, in the request buffer, that request, load or store, will get broken down into those commands that we talked about before, activate, pre-charge, read, write. And it's the job of the bank scheduler to determine when we want to issue those, on what clock cycle we want to issue those,
to the different banks. And then there's a bus scheduler that arbitrates between different uh, commands that want to send or receive data across the bus that connects these banks to the, the rest of the system. And finally, af at the end of the day, what we want is we send across one particular address and or DRAM command to a particular bank. We can start servicing the request, and then we do the same thing over and over again to continue making progress in the program. And this, these bank schedulers and the bus scheduler are what we refer to as the memory access scheduler. So that's kind of one component of a, a memory controller. And these things up here, the, the different request buffers, we refer to as the memory request buffers. They just provide some buffering data. And then once data is serviced in DRAM, it's sent back to the caches um, where it can then be given, handed off back to the program. OK. Let's take a look once again at how the DRAM operates. Um, I'll go a bit quickly through this slide because I think we've been, kind of been talking about this the entire time, just without a picture. So we have different rows. We have different columns. At the intersection of a row and column is a single bit of data. And we have this thing called the row buffer. Initially, the row buffer is empty. Uh, let's say we want to access row 0, column 0. We'll send the row address to a row decoder. It will select a particular row, row 0. We'll bring the contents of row 0 down into the row buffer. This is using the activate command. Once row 0 is in the row buffer, we use this column mux to mux out the particular column that we're interested in, column 0. And we send that back to the program. If we want to access column 1, we have a row buffer hit because row 0 is still in the row buffer. We access column 1, mux it out, we're done. Same thing with column 85, all of the columns in that row. And once we want to access a different row, well, now we have a row buffer conflict. We need to pre-charge the contents of the row buffer back into the array, although that's not really illustrated in this picture. That's what's actually going on. And we can then select row 1. OK. <clears throat> so let's. Before we dive into more complex systems, let's just recap what makes sense for a single core system, where we just have one program running. It's our program. We want it to go as fast as possible. There's nothing else in the system. So for that type of scenario, row buffer conflicts take a really long amount of time to service, and we want to minimize them. So policies like we've learned about before, such as FRFCFS, make a lot of sense. If all we want to do is speed through one thread's request to memory as fast as possible, FRFCFS seems like a good option. We can maximize row buffer hit rate um, to minimize DRAM throughput and ensure forward progress, as we've talked about. So here's a question. And I think it's probably obvious what the answer is, but is this a good policy for a multi-core system? I'm not looking, I, I guess, Let's not determine yes or no. I'll give you the answer. This isn't a good policy for a multi-core system. But can any of you think of some reasons why this might not be a good policy when you have multiple threads? My thread and your thread want to use memory. Yeah? I think, well, he went over this before. But it's cool. just when you have like the starvation. So if you have a particular program that keeps having a bunch of row buffer hits, for example, then the other thread will be starved because it might just be accessing some other area of memory. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah, so I guess he's shown you the, his favorite um, MATLAB and GCC example. Yeah. Good. We're going to look at a, that a lot more today. So <laughs> yeah, so as you might remember with MATLAB and GCC, you have two programs with two very different access characteristics. If you just use something like FRFCFS, you're going to be prioritizing one of them over the other. And it's not clear that that's what the user of the system really wants to happen. OK, so many cores on chip. Um, this is an increasing trend that we keep seeing. So we have some systems that you might have in 
your desktop that have you know maybe four cores, eight cores. <clears throat> you probably actually have might have this in your desktop, even though it has 448 cores, but it would be a GPU. Um, and then there's other more experimental or future systems that do different things that have lot, lots and lots of cores as well that are more like CPUs as opposed to GPUs. <clears throat> so ideally what we want is if we design a system that has eight cores, we want it to run eight times as fast as a system with one core, right? But that's obviously not what's going to happen because there's various different bottlenecks that could arise. So what do we get today? <laughs> well, I'll explain this again, but I'll go quickly through it. On the x-axis, we have um, two different programs, two programs that have very different characteristics that we'll look at again, just to recap. Um, MATLAB, which is running on core 0, and GCC, which is running on core 1. On the y-axis, we have the slowdown compared to when they're just running alone on that system. So you can see that when we put them together, one of them slows down very little, the other one slows down a lot. <clears throat> if you even change the priority and you try and tell the operating system, hey, you know, GCC is really important to me, I would like it to go as fast as possible, the operating system can't do much in this particular case. So where does this slowdown come from? Well, at the highest level, you can think of it this way. In the system, we have physical resources, like banks or channels, things that we've started to learn about. And only one thing can be accessing these banks or channels at the same time. So if two programs want to access the same physical resource, they're out of luck. One needs to access it before the other. And that's fundamentally where all of this slowdown comes from. Now, we'll make that concept more concrete here. You'll typically have a multi-core chip with different levels of cache, some interconnect that we labeled as a crossbar in the previous figure. And these resources, the core and the cache, those are private to the particular thread that's accessing them. So it gets full access to all of those resources. But once its data starts going out into this area of the computer, the shared memory system, now it has to contend with every other core that's running alongside it. And so this is really where the unfairness arises. In the memory controller, because of the limited physical resources in the memory system. So here's an example with a streaming application and a random application. Let's assume we have FRFCFS, as we've been talking about. That prioritizes row hits, with the, which the streaming application will have a ton of. So what happens? Well, the streaming application is just going through and streaming across all of these different banks. And the random application is sitting behind it, wondering, when can I access my random row in bank three? And this continues. Streaming application keeps accessing all of the memory. Now, the oldest first part of FRFCFS will eventually service some of the requests from the random application. This is just an illustrative example. So here's what those applications might look like at a high level for the streaming application, which we'll call a memory performance hog. It's hogging all of the resources. Um, it could be doing something as simple as just going through memory and assigning the contents of one array to another array. And it's going through in this loop line by line. Have you learned what a cache line is? I'm assuming you have since you've looked at caching, right? Cache lines are typically maybe like 64 bytes. They're kind of the unit of data that we have to grab from main memory at once. We can't just ask the main memory for a single byte. We have to grab a cache line. So in this case, it's just going through memory cache line by cache line and assigning it from one array to another. Um, it's sequentially accessing memory, very high row buffer locality, as you might expect, and memory intensive. Actually, here's something to think about. So we say that it has very high memory locality, row buffer locality, but we're making an assumption here. Can you think about what assumption we're making for the streaming program to have high row buffer locality? 
Yeah. Well, it doesn't it depend on how the information is actually mapped across the chips. Yeah. So who says we have to just put a program's data sequentially across all of the rows in one chip and then go to the next chip, put it sequentially across the row, go to the next chip, put it sequentially across the row? Why can't we just take you know, the address of a cache block maybe XOR it with some magical bits to give it a bit of randomness and place it in that location in main memory. So maybe we might spread sequential cache blocks across multiple different chips. We can do this as long as we have a one-to-one -one mapping between cache block addresses and chips within the memory system. So one thing to keep in mind is that we're making a, an assumption here which is that our memory system uses something called row interleaving. That's where when, we're, when sequential addresses map to the same row in memory. Alternatively, you could think of doing cache block interleaving, where every cache block, every sequential cache block, instead of mapping to the same row within a chip, maps to the next chip in the DRAM device. You can still kind of alleviate some of these problems, but they don't go away. You can still have lots of contention in main memory. I just wanted to make that clear. So we're streaming through the array. So here's the random application. Um, it accesses the same amount of data as the streaming application. It just does so randomly instead of going cache block by cache block. And it does that using a call to the um, rand function. So it has very low row buffer locality. This wouldn't change whether you're using cache block interleaving or row interleaving. So what does this memory hog actually do when it comes down to the memory devices? Let's step through an example here. Here we're showing the memory request buffer for this particular bank. You can see that there's one request that is already in the row uh, request buffer. That's from thread 0 to row 0. And row 0 has been loaded into the row buffer for this bank. Thread 0 is the streaming application. Thread 1 is the random application. So we mux out some data from row 0. Here we're not specifying which column, though it looks like it's selected column 0. Um, and we receive some requests from thread 1 that queues up for row 16, and for thread 0 that queues up for row 0. Yeah? I actually have a question. Do you necessarily need multiple cores for this? Because if the way I thought about it is, imagine you having one core and then like two separate programs. Because the load instruction does take multiple cycles, or mm -hmm. it, it would, right? Um, then if program one is still kind of having all these hits, it'll just be able to kind of keep progressing and kind of fill up this request buffer while program right. two can't really fill it up because it can't pass that instruction. Sure. So is the question, can you see this kind of interference within a single application? Part. Yeah, and the answer is, Yes, because remember we can schedule requests um, out of order. And because we have, do you remember the concept of non-blocking caches? That's where if we're servicing a memory request for a particular cache and we get some more requests to the cache, we can go ahead and issue them. Because we have those in our, we, because we have that sort of functionality in our system, we can even see this effect with a single application. But why is it not as bad with a single application? What makes this a little bit better of a situation? Yeah? Well, no particular part of the single application is going to run forever. So there's that aspect, which is we have some sort of bound on when an application will complete. Another thing to think about is if I'm a programmer of this single application that has this memory interference, I can potentially look at the source code. I can maybe change the order that I access certain data. Maybe I could change the data structure to speed it up. I could profile my application, figure out where the slowdowns are, and try and change that. But the really sort of the more serious case is what if I'm running on, an app, on a system with another thread that causes this behavior to happen? It's not my thread. It's some arbitrary binary that's just running alongside me. And when I profile the performance of my application, it's just slow for some reason. But sometimes it's fast. But most of the time, it's slow. 
it's really hard for an application developer to try and optimize their program if they have a bunch of unknown sources of slowdown that they have no way of understanding or even trying to get rid of. So this can happen in a single thread, but it's a much more serious case when we have multiple threads that are competing with one another. That's why we'll focus on that for, for these, these uh, policies. So we service the request for row 0, and you can picture what happens. Thread 1 keeps queuing up requests, and thread 0 keeps getting its requests serviced. This leads to starvation for thread 0 because its requests aren't being satisfied. Now eventually, when row 0 accesses all of its data in the row buffer, it can only do that for a finite amount of time because we have caching and these other things. Then thread 1 can access its data. But for a row size of 8 kilobytes, which is reasonable, and a cache block size of 64 bytes, we could service 128 requests from thread 0. There's 128 cache blocks in a row. Before we service a single request from thread 1 using FRCFS. So this can lead to that slowdown, which we could measure on real systems. And this happens with a bunch of different programs, as Owner and his colleague tested. <clears throat> so why is this bad? Well, we've sort of assumed that it's bad, and we've talked about a, a couple of particular reasons. Let's quantify those. So you have unfair slowdown among the different threads that are running on the system. This leads to low system performance, because certain threads just aren't making any progress at all. You have this vulnerability to denial of service, which is an attack whereby some person on the system can cause another thing on the system to not get any service at all. We see this sometimes in computer security with denial of service attacks. That's where one person sends a bunch of requests to a web server that prevents another user from accessing that web server just because it's overloaded with servicing the first user's requests. But this can happen in the memory system as well. And we could have priority inversion. Remember from before, we tried to tell the OS, I really want this application to go fast, and it wasn't able to do anything about it. I guess another thing that we kind of talked about with the single thread versus multi-thread case is that this leads to poor performance predictability. If I'm a programmer and I want to speed up my code, I want to know when it's going slow and why. With different threads that are slowing down each other differently, I can maybe know when my program is slowing down, but I might not have any idea why. This leads to an uncontrollable and unpredictable system, um, which, to be honest, is largely what happens in today's systems. You might not notice it very much um, because you don't normally see like the exceptional case, or we've just grown accustomed to this level of performance. But for the vast majority of today's systems, they use similar scheduling policies among their different threads. So we're going to look at ways that we can potentially fix this in future systems. <clears throat> So just to make the, the point even more clear, we're sharing all of these resources. And because we're increasing the number of cores per chip, but we don't want to increase the number of pins per chip because pins are really expensive, as you might have talked about before, that means that bandwidth per, per core is reducing, which means that this, all the problems we've been talking about are only exacerbated going forward. And different threads that interfere with each other in the memory system, and they cause resource contention, as we've talked about. They can also happen to harm different threads' bank level parallelism. Are you familiar with the concept of bank level parallelism? Can somebody give me a high level example of what that concept is? Or have you not learned about it? That's OK, too. OK, well, regardless, bank level parallelism is when an application issues multiple outstanding requests to different banks in the memory system. So remember, we might have eight banks or 16 banks. We can operate each of these in parallel of one another. 
So if an application has 16 outstanding requests all going to 16 banks, that's great because we can overlap most of the long latency of accessing each of those banks in parallel. When you have a bunch of applications running on the system, as we saw, we can actually harm bank level parallelism as well. <clears throat> so we talked about most of these, these delays at a high level or through examples. Um, there's just various different resources where requests can contend, banks, buses, channels. There's also delays that occur in the memory system because of how we schedule requests. Remember I talked about we had to break down requests into commands? How many commands do you think does it take to operate a DRAM chip? Like a command like activate or precharge, read, write. Hint, there's more than four. But how many do you think there are in actual devices? Any guesses? 15. 15? More, typically? 34. 34? You're getting closer. Yeah, there's like maybe 40 or maybe 50, something like that, right? And all of these requests have to, are basically programmed into some sort of finite state machine that you use to access the DRAM devices. But these are another source of contention in DRAM that we don't normally think about when we just want to issue a load or store, right? So requests from different devices, from different threads, can compete with each other in the way that they send out these different commands. Now, in your project, you won't have to handle 34 different commands, but or 44 or 50, just something to keep in mind. And this is called protocol overhead. So row conflicts, read to write, write to read delays, and there's a bunch of other things. And we can lose intra-thread parallelism, as we talked about before. You can even have this parallelism and slowdown within a single thread. OK, so as we said, existing DRAMs controller are sort of unaware of all of these problems that can potentially happen in the memory system. And they just try and maximize throughput, which as we said for a single thread is great, and you can use FRFCFS for. And they're just unaware and unfair to the different threads in the system. So here's one way that we can try and solve this problem. We'll build up some different approaches, some different tools that we can add to our toolbox to hopefully solve this problem. But here's one way of looking at it. So we have a bunch of cores, and we have the memory controller. Here we've abstracted it as just a a big block, and they're accessing memory. So the memory controller is this thing that resolves memory contention by scheduling requests. So if you think about it, this is the best, this is sort of our best hope if we want to alleviate that contention in the memory system. We can change the policies here. We can prioritize different threads from one another. We can monitor or predict how threads are being slowed down and take action all within this resource. So this has been the focus of a bunch of different research to try and understand why are threads being slowed down and how can we help that problem, help fix that problem. So the goal of the memory controller is to provide high system performance, high fairness to applications, and ideally, configurability to system software. What do we mean by that? Well. If I tell the system that I want a thread to have high priority and go fast, I want the memory controller to obey that as well. Okay? And it needs to be aware of different threads. So we'll begin our whirlwind tour by looking at this first paper called Stall Time Fair Memory Scheduling. Um, we'll be looking at a, because memory scheduling is something that Professor Mutlu has done a lot of research in, we'll take a look at some of the state-of-the-art scheduling policies that he and his group have looked at to see how they can solve this problem or help solve it. One of the things that you'll notice is because the motivation for memory scheduling is similar regardless of the particular policy, we'll continue to see these sort of motivational slides and I won't spend too much time on them. So you can get 
all of the same problems that we talked about before, um, leading to that uncontrollable and unpredictable system. And here's one way that they initially tried to solve the problem. So there's something called stall time fair memory scheduling. And the goal of STFM was that thread sharing main memory should experience similar slowdowns compared to when they're running alone. What does that mean? So if we have two threads running on a system, we want both of those threads to be slowed down equally compared to when they're run alone on the same system. Right? So if we have a, really, a thread that just goes really fast when it's alone and a thread that's really slow when it's alone, when we put them together, the slow one should go no more than 2x slower than it originally did, and the same thing for the fast one. We'll call this fair scheduling. It's not clear that this is the most fair thing that you could do, but that's the definition that we'll look at in this context. Another way to sort of pose why we would want to look at fairness is that this also means that the overall, progr the overall progress of all of the threads in the system are proportional. So we don't have one thread that's just going really, really fast and using all of the resources. This can be a good property for systems to have. The key idea is that the memory controller actually tries to estimate how much different threads are slowed down due to interference. So it tries to predict in the same way that prefetching tries to predict characteristics of the system. In this case, we're looking at how threads are slowed down. And we schedule requests in a way to balance the slowdowns. If we know how much a thread is slowed down, we can try and take action. Now, we can't have a perfect prediction because we can't really know what the thread, or actually, let, let's think about this for a second. Why is this hard? I think I gave away the answer. But can, can somebody tell me why predicting thread slowdown is hard? What do we need to know to know thread slowdown? I, I saw a hand. Yeah? Um, you're probably never running a thread alone. That's why you, you never have a single thread running on, on the other process. That's why I mean, you always have other threads along with it. That's right. So, so that's yeah, that, that's, that's a, exactly the point. Yeah. You don't know what other threads will be running with it. So yeah, those are two really important problems. The first one is when we're running these threads and we see this thread is servicing this many, let's just say, memory requests per second. How do we know how many it would have serviced if it had just been running alone on the system? We don't, right? Unless we ran it alone before and we measured that somehow. But it could depend on things like what input we were given, what phase of the program it's in. The other thing is, even if we could figure out some more information about a thread, like its different characteristics, beforehand, we don't really know what threads it's going to be running with concurrently when we choose to improve its performance. One time it could be running with a very non-intensive application, and we could say, oh, it experiences very little slowdown on this system. And then suddenly we run this thread with a very intensive application, and whoa, its slowdown is, slowdown is huge. So there's a bunch of different dynamic things that make this a hard problem. So let's look at how this paper chose to try and solve it. So as we said, we want to have equal slowdown for the different threads in the system. This paper looks at the DRAM-related stall time. They, this is defined as the time a thread spends waiting for DRAM memory. This can happen when a thread is running alone or when it's running together. When it's running together, we'll call this the stall time shared. This is the DRAM-related stall time when the thread runs with other threads. And when it's alone, it's stall time alone. And the memory slowdown is the ratio of the stall time when it's shared to the stall time when it's alone. Stall time shared will always be greater than or equal to stall time alone. Well, in, in most cases, that will be the case. So memory slowdown in this paper is measured as the relative increase in memory-related stall time. As we just talked about, 
the stall time alone, that's the thing that is kind of hard to measure or might not even be possible to measure. Stall time shared, we, we can actually measure that at, at runtime. We can just keep a counter for each thread, which are the number of, let's say, cycles that it spends waiting for all of its requests to be serviced in memory. So STFM aim, aims to equalize this memory slowdown metric for the interfering threads without sacrificing performance. So it considers um, the inherent performance of the thread, or it tries to approximate that, and it aims to allow proportional progress by equalizing these slowdowns. So in terms of the actual implementation, for each thread, the DRAM controller, like we mentioned, it tracks the stall time when the threads are all sharing the resources in the system. And it needs to estimate the stall time when a thread is running alone on the system. And it computes this ratio each cycle in the DRAM controller. And it also computes unfairness, which is the max slowdown divided by the min slowdown. Why, why is this unfairness? So max slowdown among all of the threads divided by min slowdown. What does this tell you about the system, this metric for unfairness? What does it tell you? It basically says, I have one thread in the system that's going x times slower than before. And I have another thread in the system that's going y, that's probably a lot less than x times slower in the system. So I have one thread that's slowed down a lot, and I have one thread that's slowed down a little. You can imagine that in a, in a perfectly balanced system, this would be equal to 1. The most slowed down thread would be slowed down exactly the same as the least slowed down thread. But as these two things start to diverge, this unfairness metric will start to increase. And we'll see how we use that in the technique to determine when we want to turn on fair memory scheduling or let the system sort of just run how it naturally would. That's done using this threshold parameter, alpha. So if unfairness in the system is less than some desired level that we want to call unfair, then we use a DRAM throughput oriented scheduling, basically FRFCFS. However, the main contribution of this paper, if unfairness is greater than or equal to alpha, we use a fairness oriented scheduling policy. What does that look like? Well, you probably could come up with this policy yourself, which is we schedule requests from the thread with the max slowdown first. So do you see what we're doing here? We're identifying the thread that has been slowed down the most. We're recognizing that by using the unfairness metric. And then in order to hopefully speed up that thread and lower the unfairness metric, we schedule requests from the thread that has been slowed down the most over other requests in the system. And then after we're done with that, we switch over to row hit first, oldest first. Does this make sense? Cool. Let's look at a quick example. So similar diagram from before. We have our memory hog, let's say, thread 0. And the nicer thread, thread 1. Here is unfairness, which will get updated as we sort of play through this slide. And our alpha that we set for the system is 5. Point, sorry, 1.05. So max slowdown divided by min slowdown needs to be greater than 1.05 in order for the policy to kick in. So we service a request from thread 0. A request from row, uh, from thread 1 to row 16 comes in. With FRFCFS, remember that's the default policy that we're using before unfairness, the unfairness oriented policy kicks in. We'll go ahead and service the requ request from thread 0 just like before. But look what happened. This time, when we service the request from thread 0, we noticed that thread 1 started to slow down. Right? Now, this depends on the 
we, we have to make sure that we knew that on a, on a system where thread one is running alone, its request would have been serviced. But we won't go into those details. The paper provides a mechanism to estimate that. But if we know that, we can, we can observe that suddenly, starting now, thread one has been slowed down. But as you can see, the unfairness in the system still isn't large enough for our special policy to kick in. So we'll keep executing. Maybe the thing will fix itself, the unfairness. Well, as we can probably predict, the unfairness persists. Thread one gets slowed down by 1.06. And now unfairness in the system is 1.06. That's above the threshold that we set of alpha, 1.05. So now we start prioritizing requests from the most slowed down thread. So even though we have a request to row 0 from thread 0 that we could access and have a row hit, we don't do that. What we actually do is we service the request from thread 1, thereby lowering the unfairness in the system. Now that it's gone back down to a reasonable level of unfairness, we go back to the throughput-oriented policy. And this proceeds. Is this clear to everyone? This can continue to go on in the system, and it'll just turn on when unfairness is too large. I'll let you go through these slides later. <clears throat> so let's just quickly summarize the pros and cons, and then we'll go for a short break. So the benefits of STFM is it's the first algorithm that looked at fair memory scheduling in the system, right? Nobody had looked at this before. And interestingly enough, even today, not many systems consider metrics like this. Um, it provided a mechanism to estimate the slowdown of a thread. We didn't go into that. But again, that's an interesting tool to be able to have if you can predict this in a running system. And as the authors showed, it's good at providing fairness. Um, and of course, as we saw, being fair can, in fact, improve performance. So the downsides are it doesn't handle all types of interference. Other types of interference can arrive in the system. For example, threads can contend for the disk in, the same, in exactly the same ways that we've been describing they can contend for main memory. But it also turns out that a lot of applications happen to have working sets that fit within main memory. And so it's an interesting concern to look at speeding up applications f that contend for that resource. It's somewhat complex to implement because of the prediction that has to go on and the constant monitoring of these values, although those can be simplified somewhat. And the most important thing, we have to be able to accurately estimate slowdown when the threads are running together compared to when they're running alone. Um, in this paper, they had a relatively good heuristic um, that helped improve the application performance. Some of Owner's student um, Lavanya's work actually looks at how do you do this at an even more precise granularity um, for threads that are running in the memory system, though we won't talk about that today. OK, with that, let's take a quick break. And when we come memory back, memory scheduling. So we looked at one policy in the last half of the class and kind of built up to the problem. Um, and STFM, the stall time fair memory scheduler, what they were trying, what that work was trying to do was how do you minimize the slowdown between different threads? And it took a very explicit approach, right? It directly measured slowdown, or tried to. In this work, um, the observation is that threads can slow each other down in sometimes ways that we don't have to necessarily directly measure. We can just approximate by observing, hey, this thread has, you know, this sort of characteristic that shows that, uh, that it has the potential to go fast. But because of the memory scheduler, we're currently not allowing it to do that. So let's try and fix that problem. We'll go into more detail in these next slides. But that's the high level difference between that previous work and this work. So the other problem that I was referring to right now um, that arises due to interference is we have this long latency DRAM. And there's multiple outstanding requests. So we normally think about, or we have been thinking about, speeding up a program in terms of how is it accessing its data from the row buffer. 
or how long is it waiting to access its data from the row buffer. But another important characteristic of how programs can be sped up by accessing memory that we kind of talked about was memory level parallelism. Remember, we have processors where we can issue a bunch of outstanding memory requests. We have non-blocking caches. And because of that, we could potentially have a lot of requests that could be serviced in parallel among all of the different banks in the system. But we can only take advantage of this, of a program's memory, memory level parallelism if we actually allow the request to proceed in parallel in different banks. And as we'll see, this can be prevented for, for a variety of different reasons. <clears throat> so the threads share the controller. We have a similar problem to before. The controller doesn't, in most systems, doesn't have any notion of a program's memory level parallelism. I'll call it MLP or bank level parallelism, BLP, because of FRFCFS. In fact, FRFCFS just tries to service requests from a single bank very quickly and has no idea about multiple banks. So let's take a look at how this can actually affect applications' performance. Here's an example of bank parallelism. We have two banks. Each can be accessed independently. And accessing each one has a long latency. And we have a single thread running in the system, thread A. Let's say thread A does some computation. Um, things are happening in the core itself. And it issues two DRAM requests. Well, you can probably guess where those two DRAM requests each go to. One of them wants to access row 1 in bank 0. The other one wants to access row 1 in bank 1. Cool. So let's service the first request in bank 0. We'll issue that. And let's service the second request in bank 1. So we have some stall time associated with accessing the request from each bank, which is this stall time. But as you can see, we've overlapped the stall time of accessing each bank in parallel by issuing these two requests at almost the same time. They're a little bit offset because we can't issue two requests at exactly the same cycle. So bank 0 finishes servicing that request. We receive our data back. Bank 1 finishes servicing its request. And now we can go along and keep computing. So we overlap the request, and we end up with approximately one bank access latency, modulo a few cycles. Now, we have two requests. We have two threads in the system. Hint, they're going to interfere somehow. Let's see how. So they both do some sort of computation. They both issue two DRAM requests. If either of them were running alone on the system, they could overlap these requests. But here's what happens when they're running together. The requests happen to arrive at this particular order. And so thread A starts its request being serviced in bank 0. That leads to some stall time. But, bank, but thread A is making a little bit of progress here. Thread B gets its request serviced in bank 1. So it makes some progress servicing that request. Each of these requests finish being serviced in their respective banks at around the same amount of time. But look what happened. Instead of parallelizing the requests from each of the threads as before, we chose to schedule one request from each thread in each bank. So no threads got their requests serviced in parallel. And only after we've completed servicing each of the threads separate requests can we go on and service the rest of them. I guess I lied a little bit. There's one tiny fraction of time when thread B can actually have both of its requests being serviced in both of the banks. But it's so small compared to the total access time of the bank that it almost doesn't make a difference. So we go ahead and issue the second round of requests to each of the banks. And being serviced in different banks and being serviced in serial compared to the first request, they take the full amount of time required to access each of them. And only once they've both been serviced for each of the applications can we start computing again. So what happened here? What went wrong? Well, we weren't aware of 
the parallelism that the application sort of gave us to work with, right? The, the thread sort of said, hey, I have this parallelism. Can you try and use it to speed us up? But the memory scheduler had no notion of how it could do that. So how can we change that? In this case, it, it led to about two bank stall times worth of delay for each of the threads. So here's how a parallelism aware scheduler might handle this situation. We have the same setup as before. Each of the threads issue two DRAM requests. They arrive in the same exact order. But look at this. This scheduler is able to identify that one of the threads, I guess we kind of arbitrarily picked thread one because its first request got scheduled first, it has some bank level parallelism. Why don't we try and take advantage of that? How can we do that? Well, just service the other requests to parallel banks at the same time. What happens if we do that? Well, thread A's requests get serviced in parallel. So we have this nice overlapping of latencies like we did before. Thread B is still waiting for its request to be serviced. But look what happens. When thread A finishes servicing its requests, they finish at about the same time. And thread B's requests can be issued at about the same time, meaning that thread B can also overlap the latency of its requests just at a bit later than thread A. What does this mean? Well, if we look at an individual thread, just finishing up this example, if we look at thread A, it has basically the same stall time as when it was running alone. And thread B was stalled time, was stalled basically the same as when they were run together using a not very good policy. And you might look at this and say, well, thread B is still being slowed down. Have we really solved the problem? And the answer is, well, it kind of depends. If you look at it at just a thread by thread basis and you say, I care the most about thread B, well, then maybe we're not making the best decision in this case. And maybe we want to design a technique where we can prioritize applications, and we'll see how that can happen. But if you look at, it a whole, look at the problem in a whole system perspective, what do we have now? Instead of having two bank stall latencies for each thread, what do we have? We have, on average, one and a half bank access latencies for each thread in the system. So our whole system has sped up as a result, even though one of the threads did the same as sort of in the bad case, one of the threads did much better. So from a whole system perspective, it does well. We'll need to be able to handle how we control this as well. And we'll take a look at that. OK, so that's, that's the basic high-level idea of parallelism-aware batch scheduling, PAR-BS. It's not BS, but it's as you might be led to believe. Um, the basic idea is that you just incorporate parallelism awareness. It's that simple. You can even probably start to think about ways of tracking that in your head if you were designing the memory controller in your project. So you want to schedule requests from a thread. Is that a PowerPoint issue? I don't think so. To different banks back to back. And so you want to be able to try and preserve each thread's bank level parallelism as much as possible. That's the first design consideration. But as we mentioned, this can cause starvation if we're just prioritizing threads with lots of bank level parallelism in exactly the same way as prioritizing threads with lots of row buffer hits can cause starvation. So this is sort of a general technique that different networks and systems employ to prevent starvation. Maybe you've seen this in other classes. But you can do something called batching, where you basically say, I'm going to take a bundle of requests. And at some point in time, I'm going to say, stop. I'm going to service all the requests I've received so far before I service any of the future requests that will continue to queue up. That's called batching. By grouping requests into fixed size batches and servicing all of the requests in an older batch before any of the requests in a newer batch, we can prove that the system will continue to make forward progress even if we do sort of arbitrary prioritization decisions. So that's the way that, that PARBS sort of handles this issue. Like I mentioned, in the context of this technique, it just 
groups a fixed number of oldest requests to form a batch, services the batch before all other requests, and then it forms a new one, new batch, once the current one is done being serviced. Eliminates starvation, provides fairness. And what you'll see this being used to do is basically enable this parallelism as well, right? If I grab a bunch of memory requests, and I'm just holding a bunch of requests in a batch, I can do a, a bunch of different things with them. I could just take a batch and service it like with the first ready requests. That's possible. Or I could take a batch and I could say, hey, I have all of these requests from thread, from thread zero that go to different banks. I'm going to service all of them first, taking ad advantage of memory parallelism. And we'll see how this framework allows you to do that. Here's the rough sketch of the idea. We have th four threads running on the system, T0 through T3, two banks in the system. We're going to sort of pick a batch. Maybe we'll say when eight requests come in, I'm just going to form a batch. Great. And then within this batch, we'll choose how to prioritize requests in this technique with a focus on bank level parallelism. So instead of servicing, let's back up. Instead of servicing T0 and T1 as they arrived within the batch, we can observe that I want to service this request to T0 to bank one. Hey, batch, are there any other requests from T0 <laughs> to other banks that I can service in parallel? And we can see that, yes, there is one. We can service these in parallel. Other requests might continue to arrive. That's OK, but they're not part of this batch. And then we service requests from, say, T1 to the different parallel banks, T2, T3. And finally, we form the next batch. Everybody OK with the high level design goal for this, for PARBS? Cool. So there's two things that are going on here, like we mentioned, request batching and within batch scheduling. And this paper chose to focus on parallelism awareness for the within batch scheduling. But you could do any, remember that earlier slide that we had that sort of said, what are the things that I can take into account when I'm scheduling requests, like prefetch versus read or write? Read or write requests themselves. You could take any of those things and apply them to within batch scheduling. But we'll take a look at how parallelism works. So, at a lower level, when we're doing batching, each memory request from a processor has a special bit called the marked bit, which denotes whether it's a part of the currently serviced, the, the batch that's currently being serviced. So when we form a batch, we mark up to this parameter called marking cap, let's say eight. We mark up to eight oldest requests per bank for each thread. Just set their marked bit to true, to one. And the marked requests constitute the batch. And we form a new batch when no marked requests are left. So after we service the first date, then we mark the next date. And marked requests are prioritized over unmarked ones. That's how we sort of get this effect of like batching everything together, right? And no reordering of requests is allowed across batches. So this makes sure that we have low starvation, no starvation, and high fairness, right? So here's the question that we're trying to answer, and then we'll look at how the authors of this paper answered how to prioritize their requests within the batch. So as I mentioned, we can really use any old scheduling policy that we would like to. FRFCFS is one option. But we, as we mentioned, we also want to preserve the bank level parallelism that the threads can potentially provide us. So what the scheduler does in this mechanism is it computes a ranking of threads when the batch is formed. How do we rank those threads? Well, we'll get into that in a second. But you can imagine that once we've assigned some ranking to each of the threads, we can go ahead and prioritize threads based on that ranking. And it improves the likelihood that requests from a thread are serviced in parallel by different banks. Why? Oh, question first. I was going to ask, why would you do this instead of doing, for example, first the memory level thing overlapping, and then if that isn't a 
What, what's the memory level thing? So first you do the memory, um, the one where you like parallelize the memory level. So you do yes. mac 0 and mac 1 to t1. Yes. And then do fr, fcfs, if there are no other threads that can be overlapped, and then do. So this way you, you ensure that they always kind of go back to back, whereas with ranking, they may likely be back to back, but not always. Do you see what I'm saying? No. <laughs> Can you explain it again? Sorry. So instead of like, you know how normally we have some order of first you do this policy, then you do this yeah, policy, yeah. then you do this policy? Yeah. So I feel like if you just rank them, some of the policies may be like kind of brought apart so they won't be effective anymore. Okay. Do we prevent this in the ranking mechanism? or? or so what type of policy are you thinking could get destroyed by doing so the ranking? So for example, the overlapping could get destroyed if you don't rank them. Ah, so, well, so the, the ranking is actually what preserves the overlapping of requests. And here's why. What we're ranking are not the requests themselves, but the threads, right? Oh. So what's actually happening, and we'll see an example of this, is when you say thread zero has the highest rank, at each of the bank schedulers, remember, when we break apart requests into commands, they go to bank. Um, they're, they're serviced at each of the banks individually. At each of the bank schedulers, it sees, oh, thread zero has the highest rank. I'm going to service all of thread zero's requests first. So the highest ranked thread gets all of its requests serviced first, which hopefully ensures that they'll all be, res all be serviced in parallel. Now, it's worth mentioning that this is just sort of a heuristic to enable memory parallelism. We're not explicitly laying out all of the requests in memory to make sure that we're maximizing parallelism. But as we'll see, it works fairly well for, for allowing that. OK. So the question is, how do we rank threads now to enable this parallelism? Well, the particular ranking scheme that we choose certainly will affect the throughput and fairness of the system. And we want to maximize system throughput and minimize unfairness, which unfairness is kind of similar to what we talked about in the previous work, the slowdown of different threads. We want to ideally equalize that. To minimize system throughput, or maximize system throughput, will minimize the average stall time. And to minimize unfairness, we'll service threads with inherently low stall time early in the batch. Why? Well, the idea is that delaying memory non-intensive threads results in high slowdown. Why is that the case? I don't know if this is necessarily intuitive. So what is the assertion? The assertion is that <clears throat> we want to service threads with low stall time early on in the batch. So we have a thread that has one memory request and a thread that has 25. We want to service the thread with one memory request, low stall time, right? It'll get its one request serviced and then move on, as opposed to the one with 25 that might have to wait on each other for a long time. We want to service that request first, the one with the low stall time. So why does it make sense to delay memory non-intensive what, why is it that delaying memory non-intensive threads, the one that had one request, results in a high slowdown? Why, why do you think that even makes sense? Yeah? Because a significant portion of the program running time is already like memory stuff. So whereas if you have a program that's all memory loads and you like delay it further, it's, I don't know how to express this, yeah. but you have like ALU operations and memory operations, mm -hmm. which means that the memory operations for the non-intensive program will make up a large portion of the already runtime. Mm -hmm. So if you increase these, then it, it becomes even much worse, and kind of the ALU operations don't even matter. True, true. Another uh, idea? I thinking of it like a restaurant, like if you have one big table of people and then a bunch of other small tables, like if you keep going to the big table and servicing that, like there's going to be a lot of people coming to your restaurant affecting people that have a really long time. Yeah, actually that's a, that's a good analogy, real world analogy, right? So. What both of you are getting at is that the marginal cost 
of servicing a single memory request to an application that hardly issues any memory requests is very high. Why is that? Well, it's likely that that application, when it issues a memory request, it has a bunch of ALU instructions, maybe, that depend on getting that request back. So we can't really service those while we're waiting for the memory request. Whereas the idea is the memory intensive application that has a bunch of memory requests, it probably just finished receiving a bunch of other memory requests, and it's currently performing some computation in parallel. So that's really why this key insight might make sense. Those are good, good examples. <clears throat> so this leads to doing shortest stall time first, or shortest job first, ranking within that batch. So we do this first to not unfairly slow down the low, um, the memory non-intensive threads. And by doing the ranking, we're able to hopefully speed up the memory intensive threads by utilizing multiple banks. Can you see the subtlety here? If we had just looked at bank level parallelism and we prioritize threads that have high bank level parallelism first, we'd be doing probably the exact opposite of this because the memory intensive threads are probably the ones that will have the most bank level parallelism because they're just issuing a bunch of requests to main memory. So that's why it's important we need to first rank requests based on their stall time. And then for the memory intensive ones, we'll service them in the order that hopefully maximizes bank level parallelism. OK, and people have shown that shortest job first scheduling in a queuing theoretic sense provides optimal system throughput. Um, and the controller can estimate the stall time. We'll see an example. And it ranks threads with the shorter stall time higher, as we said. Cool. So we basically discussed why doing this makes sense through the use of examples. Um, in the case of a tie for stall time, um, we rank threads with lower total load, so lower total number of requests, higher. That's because all other things being equal in terms of stall time, we want to service the requests that could potentially the we want to service the requests that could potentially enable more bank level parallelism first. So here's an example. We have some more banks than before, but the same number of threads. And we're going to be measuring the max bank load and the total load. These are the things that we're measuring in the um, in the actual algorithm. So Let's look at thread 0. Thread 0 has three outstanding requests, one to each of bank 1, 2, and 3. So at each bank, it has at max one outstanding request, and it has a total load of 3. Similarly, for thread 1, it has four outstanding requests. The max bank load in this case is at bank 0, where it has two outstanding requests. For thread 2, max bank load is 2 for either bank 1 or bank 2, and the total number of outstanding requests is 6. And thread 3, which is kind of this memory-intensive thread that also has high bank level parallelism. Max bank load is 5, and the total load is 9. So what would PARBS do? Well, first it would rank the threads in this way. We would first look at max bank load to figure out what are the threads with the shortest stall time? This is sort of a, an approximation of stall time. And we would see that, well, certainly thread 0 has the fewest max bank load requests. Between thread 1 and thread 2, we have a tie for the bank load. So we actually need to look at the total load. And we would prioritize thread 1 before thread 2. And finally, we would prioritize thread 3 last. So here's the baseline scheduling order. This is looking at first come, first serve. So this example doesn't assume anything about row buffer locality, just something to keep in mind. And this is time ticking up in terms of requests that are arriving at the different banks. So if we look at the stall time for thread 0, the stall time is 4. It will take basically four bank access latencies before the last of its queued up requests get serviced. For thread 1, it's 5 for a similar reason. Thread 2 is 5. It will take 
five units of bank units of time before its final request gets serviced. And for thread three, it'll take seven. Is this really the best way of measuring how much time it will take for these applications to be um, serviced? I guess what we're trying to do here is compare baseline performance to par BS performance. But as an aside, is this a good way of measuring performance, looking at how long it takes to service the last request? Why or why not? Let me ask you, if you were profiling your own program and you could see which requests your program was issuing, would you measure the performance as, of your program as how long it takes the last request to get serviced? Maybe. Maybe if the rest of the computation in the program depends on that last request. But another thing to keep in mind is that as these earlier requests are being serviced, we might also be making forward progress. So it's not entirely clear that this is an exact metric for performance, but it's approximate. And it's good enough for us to use in this example to compare these two techniques. So the average for arrival order scheduling is five bank access latencies. Let's take a look at PARBS with the ranking that we established from before. So in this case, thread zero is prioritized in all of the banks at the same time. So its request gets serviced in bank one, two, and three. Cool. Even for a memory non-intensive thread that we already showed if we service is sort of the optimal way in a queuing theoretic sense to service these workloads, even it is able to benefit from bank level parallelism in this system. Stall time equal to one. Then if you follow the timeline going up, then thread one would be prioritized in this system. So this is how its requests would be queued up. Again, we're leveraging that bank level parallelism. Same thing for thread two and thread three. You can think of it as just sort of stacking on the requests from each of the threads in the order that they're prioritized. So what does this mean? Well, we were able to lower the average bank access latencies to 3.5. So we're effectively taking advantage of parallelism within the system. Great. And I'm running horribly behind. So instead of just sort of racing through all of these slides, I'll try and get through the rest of PARBS um, and hopefully into the next technique after that so that Professor Mutlu doesn't get too angry at me. Um, so PARBS, what does it do? Remember we talked about all of these scheduling policies? You can basically sum them up as a list of things that we want to prioritize. Here's PARBS, PARBS's list. First, we service marked requests. That's the batching. Then we service row hit requests first. This was a design decision. We didn't really talk about this in the buildup of the mechanism. But it turns out that row buffer locality is such an important part of program performance. And it's so costly to switch rows that even in something like PARBS, whose goal it is to maximize parallelism, even they make the decision of servicing row hit requests first. And then after that, we service the requests from the different threads in the multiple banks. And then we service the oldest requests um, to finish off that batch. That's batching. That's the scheduling. So three things are really going on here. One is it's exploiting row buffer locality and intra-thread bank parallelism. If we had just focused on bank parallelism, we would lose out on the benefits of row buffer locality. It's also work conserving. Are, are any of you familiar with the concept of work conservation in like systems or in systems that have queues or things like that? It's OK. It's not like a, a huge concept. It just basically means that when we have a resource that's idle and we could use it, we're going to use it. And that's what PARBS does, because it will service unmarked requests, requests that are not in the current batch, to banks that don't have any marked requests. So we're not so strict as to say, Bank zero is completely idle for the rest of the batch. I will not service any unmarked requests to it because they are not marked. We'll go ahead and service them, and then we'll form the batch um, with the remaining requests after that. Also, that marking cap, remember what that is? That's the number of requests that we use to form a batch. 
That's important. So what the authors found was that if this is too small, it destroys row buffer locality. Why is that? Yeah. Because the scope might not be big enough for you to see the next request that might use that same. Yeah. Scope. It's like you have this event horizon of requests, right? And you can only see certain requests depending on the size of the marking cap. So marking cap being small limits your flexibility. But if it's too large, it penalizes memory non-intensive threads. Why? Why is that? Yeah? It kind of defeats the batching principle. Like as your batch size approaches infinity, it becomes a starvation thing again. So yeah. So you approach that, I mean, if you get too big, then you're getting rid of the batch. Exactly. In the limiting case, the reason why we established batching was to prevent this starvation. But if our batches are just really, really huge, now those non-memory intensive threads won't get their requests in a batch, and they'll have to wait a really long time for the current batch to finish being serviced. And as we already said, they can't tolerate much additional latency. Cool. So the authors looked at how much this would cost to implement in hardware. Um, it can be done relatively efficiently. It doesn't have any really complex operations. It's just doing some simple ranking using like a finite state machine. Um, and it's not on the critical path. So the scheduler is just sorting, sort of doing this off to the side. Here's how um, the unfairness looks on different sized systems in terms of number of cores on the x-axis. Unfairness on the y-axis, lower is better. And we have several different policies. Remember, unfairness is that metric from before, the maximum memory slowdown divided by the minimum memory slowdown. So FRFCFS, which we're familiar with, is the blue one. The yellow one is first come, first serve. Green is networked fair queuing. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail on that policy. It's just another way that was used in like communication systems for scheduling packets of like sound, for example. You could think of it like in communications for your cell phone. It sends little packets of sound. The analogy there is those are similar to packets of data from a memory request. And in communication systems, often you have these shared resources as well, right? You have fixed bandwidth wires. And you might have to prioritize some packets above others if you want to maintain good qual call quality, let's say. So network fair queuing was one way of doing that, that they adapted to memory scheduling. Stall time fair memory that we talked about before and ParBS. And as you can see, ParBS performs the best out of all pre previous techniques. Yes? But fairness doesn't necessarily indicate performance, right? Absolutely. There's a reason we use R. Yeah. <laughs> so Professor Mutlu you know, knew that people would have this question. So of course, the next slide is performance. Um, and as you can see, if we look at normalized harmonic mean speed up over all of the workloads that they looked at, um, ParBS also provides good performance as well. Good point, though. So pros and cons. I'll let you fill these in. What are the benefits of ParBS? Yeah? Fairness. Fairness, as we just saw. Yes? What else? Better performance. Better performance. Anything else? see what Professor Mutlu thinks. So it's the first scheduler to address bank parallelism destruction across multiple threads. So I guess that's a, an, an important contribution to research. It's a simpler mechanism, actually, than stall time fair memory. Nowhere did we talk about predicting anything, really. All we're doing is we're looking at the current state of the system and using that to make better prioritization decisions. With stall time fair memory scheduling, we actually have to perform this prediction, which might not be accurate, as accurate as we would like. Batching provides fairness, as we saw. And ranking enables parallelism awareness, which basically translates into good performance. OK, we saw that already. Da downsides. We didn't really talk about this, but um, it's, an, it's something important to consider, especially if you're designing your own systems. So 
ParBS sort of picks this ranking within a memory controller, right? But what if we have multiple memory controllers in our system, which does happen in, in, in systems that are designed? What do we have to do then? Do they use some sort of shared memory to communicate? Maybe they have some shared like buffer space that they use, but then that might take longer latencies for each one to access. So we might have sort of stale rankings when we go to access them. So coordination becomes an issue as we have multiple memory controllers. And because ParBS, to get the best benefits of the technique, requires coordination among all of the memory controllers to preserve that ranking, that can be a potential downside for this technique. And it doesn't always prioritize the latency sensitive applications. Um, it's hard to know for sure whether an application is latency sensitive or not. ParBS uses a heuristic to approximate latency sensitivity, but it's not clear that those are always the most latency sensitive applications. So do we want to do TCM in three minutes, or should I leave that for the next lecture? <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. OK, th thanks, everyone, for, for listening. Um, and if you have any questions on the material, feel, feel free to ask right now. What? Am I Canadian? No.